The stem cell review is presented by Celgene Cellular Therapeutics. Ladies and gentlemen of the general public, members of the medical and scientific community, uh, we're here today and for the next several shows to ask a series of scientific and business experts about the world of stem cells. We're going to be looking at the science, the medical uses, and the technology deployed in this exciting and fast-moving field. In this episode, we're going to take a look at what are stem cells. There are several types of them. Embryonic stem cells, near embryonic or induced pluripotent stem cells, and adult stem cells. We're going to take a look also at some of the key differentiating factors and also how they're used and where they're found. This episode is going to set up the foundation for all the future episodes in which we're going to take a deeper dive into the world of stem cells the research taking place on them at both the scientific level and the tools being deployed to find and use them as well as their medical applications. So to start with, it's important to understand what is a stem cell. In general, stem cells are highly plastic cells that have two key characteristics. They can self-replicate meaning they can duplicate themselves, and they can differentiate. And when they differentiate, they will differentiate into all the different types of organ or tissue downstream of where they are, creating the human body. Embryonic stem cells have been enormous tools for research for many years, for decades. Uh, and so I originally used mouse embryonic stem cells in many contexts. Um, obviously, we make genetically defined strains of mice. That's already revolutionized biology. Uh, cancer models, uh, neurodegenerative disease models, cardiac disease models across the spectrum have been helped by mouse embryonic stem cells. But with human embryonic stem cells, we now have a whole new tool. We can put human cells into a petri dish, study all the panoply of tissues that can arise from these these uh, pluripotent cells, and that gives us uh, a very immediate human model that the mouse never did. The limitation, though, was that those are generic cells. They're not patient-specific. And so we've been hoping for many years to get nuclear transfer working in the human. Of course, that hasn't worked, but what has worked is direct reprogramming. So now we have the induced pluripotent stem cells, where we start with a skin cell take it back to its embryonic state, and it has essentially all of the properties of embryonic stem cells. So now we can study tissue formation in the context of a disease model. One of the big differences between embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells is that embryonic stem cells appear to be uh, immortal in the sense that they can be allowed to proliferate indefinitely and one can uh, differentiate them. So they provide very, very large numbers of cells for this type of medical research, whereas adult stem cells uh, don't typically have that uh, property and have a limited lifetime and a limited potential in their uh, differentiation. But there are, there are limitations of, of these so-called adult stem cells. Uh, various tissue stem cells make just that tissue. They don't make all of the tissues. They are difficult to culture. Uh, they have certain properties distinct from embryonic or pluripotent stem cells. So it's not a matter of, you know, one is better than the other. It's different and we, we exploit them both. My own lab is particularly interested in the adult hematopoietic stem cell as well as all the various pluripotent stem cells. I'm a fervent believer in that if, if you ask me where do I think cell therapy is going, my, my view is, if, is that it will be for uh, areas which uh, indica clinical indications which don't need many cells and so the eye is a wonderful target in my view for cell therapy work in the future and also the skin because I think the skin is accessible 
and you can see what's going on and you can follow what's happening. So wound healing, things like that, I think are where I would uh, invest if I was a, a venture capitalist, which I'm never going to be, uh, yeah, for the future. But it'll still take some time. But the eye I really do like. But it has to be a, an indication that doesn't need many cells because the le regulatory uh, challenges, I think, increase exponentially with the number of cells that you're going to put in a dose, particularly if those cells are based on pluripotent cells like embryonic stem cells. What we believe is more critical in terms of functional restoration by stem cells is to actually allow the stem cells to behave like stem cells normally do um, when they act in their kind of natural reparative role. And what they appear to be doing is homing to areas of injury, generating new uh, blood vessels, generating new neurons, but those neurons are host-derived, so they're coming from the, the niches in the brain where they live, and they're moving from there into tissue. So it's really a, a method of self-repair rather than specifically cell replacement. I have a very great interest in dopamine neurons, but I'm actually f interested in all the cells, and, and, and that kind of integrated view, I mean, of course, leads you to the criticism that you're not focused. But actually the real answer to that, I think, is that you're perhaps focused on, on, the, on the real question, which is how are these cell types interacting? And um, I mean, one of the most interesting things, I think, in contemporary neurological research is it's becoming very clear that disease is not caused by a deficit in a single cell type. And, and, and that, I think, is a very big advance, actually, conceptually. It really opens up people's thinking. Essentially the data that we've generated now using a number of different cell lines from different tissues, um, even though you can generate cell lines that in a dish can generate beautiful dopaminergic neurons. If you can get over the issue of pluripotency, so you move that cell from being pluripotent so it doesn't make a teratoma, if you take it far enough along the road to some kind of differentiated cell or multipotent cell, once you get it into a tissue it seems to act in a very, very similar way, whatever that, the origin of that cell. And that, that's now, if you, look at the, if you look at the literature, the translational literature very closely, that's what you're seeing. And I think that's something that we've got to come to terms with, that a lot of the work that's going on within stem cells is really about what stem cells do in a dish, or maybe what they do in a development, development situation. If you're going to use those translationally in terms of sick patients, you're going to, you might very well see something that's completely different. And it doesn't really matter that much what the stem cell is, at least in terms of mode of action. It might matter a lot in terms of relative potency. But I think scientifically, you know, this field is still so underexplored. You know, what happens to cells when you put them into tissues? It's so poorly explored that, that you know, we may come, end up coming up with something that, that is quite surprising. In order to realize uh, cell transplantation therapy using iPS cells, we really have to uh, uh, double check their safeness. So I think it takes some more time before we can really apply this technology to clinics. I think the best application would be to generate disease model using iPS cell patients, specific iPS cells, and use those disease models to search for new and more effective drugs. So I think it is a very, very uh, promising application of this technology. And another promising application is uh, toxicology. You can make uh, iPS cells from patients who are sensitive to some drugs uh, in terms of cardiac toxicity, and then make cardiac myocytes from those patients' specific iPS cells. Then pharmaceutical companies can use those cardiac myocytes from iPS cells in testing uh, cardiac uh, toxicity for any new drugs. So that's another very promising application of this technology. There's been a lot of skepticism about whether cell therapies could ever be made into a viable business. Um, 
I share some of those concerns, uh, but I think it's a challenge. Uh, there was a time when people were very skeptical about whether you could deliver proteins, uh, whether the cost of goods of protein production would be so much that it would overwhelm the ability to make a business. I think we'll learn how to grow cells. We'll learn how to drive down the cost, drive up the, the, the productivity and scale. We may ultimately be able to make certain cell types transplantable across immune barriers. It may be that they don't have to persist forever in the patient. We may solve some of the immune challenges. We may be able to use immune suppression as we do an organ transplant. The prospects for individualized patient therapy um, I think are real. I think they're being driven by medical need and scientific opportunity. There may not be an easy business model there. Bone marrow transplantation, organ transplantation, that's not a business. We don't have the, uh, you know, the pharma companies selling organs, but we have an enormous industry built around those modalities. We have therapeutics, we have devices and the like. And I think that there's certainly many, many opportunities for sort of traditional pharma approaches applied to stem cell topics. There have been a number of factors that have, have limited uh, the flow of funds into the sector. I mean, the venture community has not been um, incredibly supportive of regenerative medicines over the last 10 years, and that's because of a combination of factors. Um, some of them are historical and have nothing to do with the patent office. They actually have to do with the first wave of technologies. If, if you remember back in the 90s, there was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm around the early regenerative medicine companies. Most of the companies that were high flyers during that period from 92 up to 2000 went bankrupt in 2001 and um, many in the venture community got burned as a result of that and um, if you have a nuclear bomb go off in your portfolio you tip in one particular sector you tend to stay away from that sector in the future so I think some of the reluctance of the venture community to endorse the current wave of technologies in regenerative medicines is historical and has to do with the fact that they endorsed the first wave and unfortunately uh, got burned in that process um, you know it's it's the Technology development is not linear, and, and um, the development of regenerative medicines technologies has not been linear. They've actually followed pretty closely the Gartner curve that I, I think you're probably familiar with. And earlier, the Gartner curve postulates that early adopters are not the ones who typically garner the greatest return, that there's a big hype around the technology and then there's a fall afterwards. And I think if you track the development of regenerative medicine technologies, it plots pretty nicely along that curve. The great news for folks now is we are very clearly on the second part of that Gardner slope. And uh, the technologies that are under development now, I do think, are going to generate substantial returns for their investors. Uh, I think this is a really uh, promising field now. I've never believed uh, in, I mean, a true business model, as far as I'm concerned, for any type of stem cell does not really exist. Uh, and this is one of the, uh, uh, the sort of unknown aspects or uh, slightly confusing aspects of the whole area that we go into, we talk about cell therapy being sort of over the horizon, but it's not clear to anyone really how you're going to make money out of uh, a product even if you can make it. So we're, 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 we're sort of a bit like people are in a horse race, a steeplechase, where what we want to do is get over the next fence and then we'll worry about the fence beyond and actually making the cells uh, and getting a cell therapy product that works is our first challenge and then the business model becomes the next challenge. Now as you will know that's no way to attract money into a company to tell people well we'll master the technology and then we'll worry about the business model but to some degree the investment by venture capitalists in cell therapy has been precisely that. They've thought, well, if you can make the product, there's bound to be a business model. But it's not easy to see what that business model is, neither for autologous nor allergenic uh, therapy. I think that there's been a wait and see attitude on the part of investors looking at the stem cell field. It's, there's a sense that there's a tremendous foundation to the biology and that there's obvious medical importance the fact that most of the excitement of the last decade was around embryonic stem cells and embryonic stem cells had this whole political challenge to it, I think scared away a lot of investors and probably rightfully so. But also investors realized um, 
that you didn't have patient-specific cells, which is what you really wanted. Now that we have the iPS cells, I think the whole climate has changed. I can see it's changed. Uh, it's changed in my own efforts in that I really decided now is the time to commercialize a company around patient-specific iPS cells. And what we're seeing is that virtually every major pharma is reaching out to us and asking what should our role be? Should we have internal programs? How are we going to use this for discovery? How revolutionary is this technology going to be for our drug development pipeline? Those are relevant questions today, and I think because of that, you're going to see a larger investment in the space. And it's very interesting now that since the President Obama has really moved the US administration into a much more positive position, you've got, at the same time, the drug industry moving very quickly to join up with this with this this, this area of cell therapy, so you suddenly have uh, drug companies who were really disinterested, and it's coincidental, but I think it has something to do with the change in the attitude of the administration. That this is uh, this for the community is very positive medicine instead of being an argumented uh, arguments about the merits of it. And it enables the, the, the big drug companies that are very sensitive to those community views and those political views to join in. And I think that's a huge and important uh, connection. So what are all these stem cells useful for? Well, they can repair, replace, regenerate and rejuvenate tissues and organs to which natural calamities such as aging or accidents or genetic mutations occur, and this will help change the way medicine is practiced forever. Just think of it. Repair, replace, regenerate, rejuvenate. That has been the holy grail of medicine ever since the beginning, and now we're standing at the threshold of a new age of medical practice. In the next episode, we'll be looking at the difference between allogeneic, or off-the-shelf, stem cells and autologous individual use stem cells and the implications for intellectual property protection, regulatory treatment, medical use, and financing. We're going to have some experts on this subject deliver their opinions to you, so please stay tuned to the Stem Cell Review. At Cellgene Cellular Therapeutics, our proprietary placenta-derived stem cells hold the potential to treat a range of serious diseases. Our unique processes for differentiating and producing treatments from this rich source of stem cells will enable us to deliver these therapies on a scale similar to today's biologic remedies. Proud to be at the forefront of this transformation of modern medicine, we are Celgene Cellular Therapeutics.